So like Bianca said, uh, my name is Jen Klein and I work for Portland Polytechnic University. Um, they have an Institute for Sustainable Food Systems. Um, so I'm a research associate within the Institute and work with a lot of um, talented folks who are engaging with communities around food security, food sovereignty issues, um, and ways to adapt in agriculture as climate change is affecting how we are growing food. Um, so that's just a little introduction to myself. I'll do my best to answer any questions today. Um, I'm not an expert in everything, so I'll be honest if I'm not sure of the answer, but hopefully can share um, a resource where you can find some answers to that question. Okay, so what is integrated pest management or IPM, um, as I'll be referring to it throughout the presentation. Um, so it's utilizing um, all available tools within a plant strategy and management system to maintain pest populations, diseases, uh, weeds below a reasonable damage threshold. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of these key terms, um, damage thre thresholds, pest diseases, all that sort of thing throughout the, the presentation. Um, and please do raise a hand as we're going through to ask questions throughout. I'm happy to answer as well as I can. Um, and the idea with IPM programs, because it is a program with a set of tools, that's not one single answer to how to deal with a pest. Um, it should be striving to replace um, broad spectrum practices. Um, so we'll, we'll go into that, but broad spectrum practices are um, have traditionally been used to deal with pest populations that kills basically everything rather than just targeting the pest or the weed or disease that you're trying to get rid of. Um, and why do we need integrated pest management? It's kind of a long wordy title, um, but in, in looking at um, our recent history and how kind of larger scale agriculture has dealt with pests, weeds, diseases, um, we relied a lot on synthetic chemical pesticides that became um, widely available in so-called Canada after World War II. Uh, there were a lot of these chemicals that were created that needed to be used up. Um, so they were transitioned into pesticides for insects, um, herbicides for weed control, and, and other ways to control plant fungal diseases. Um, you can see on the slide here that a lot of them were used as a broad spectrum. Again, to try and kill everything bad, not just targeting um, the pests that you're you're trying to get under control. Um, and using these broad spectrum chemicals uh, kind of exacerbated the problem, and we'll go into that um, within the the presentation of of why the problem got worse and not better from these chemical applications. Um, so bioaccumulation. Um, an ex so an example of dangerous chemical used in the 1930s um, you know, throughout the 1970s to deal with pest diseases, et cetera, um, were PBCs or polychlorinated biphenols. Um, and it's industrial chemical that's used for a lot of manufacturing processes, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, it was used quite extensively, and there was a lot of pollution that was put into the environment because of all the chemicals. Um, so the thing with bioaccumulation and the problem with these PVCs is that they, they accumulate in concentrations. And where bioaccumulation is, is bad is if you look at this diagram, we have numbers one through to four. And so the way that PVCs um, came into the environment was through these manufacturing processes. They got into um, aquatic environments and also into land, polluted the soil. 
um, and insects that are in the soil, which then polluted birds, mammals, plants that use the soil. And so um, it, these pesticides, these chemicals accumulate until they're in larger and larger concentrations up the food chain. So you can see they started in the phytoplankton in the ocean. And then, you know, bigger fish eat the phytoplankton, like shrimp, that sort of thing. And then herring eat the shrimp. And then salmon eat the herring all the way down to, to whales. And you can see by the time you get to the whale, all these red dots represent the chemical. And so that's why you hear a lot of people talking about the dangers of tuna, because they're an old large fish. And um, there's been a lot of mercury poisoning throughout the aquatic food chain. So basically accumulation of these chemicals, even when they're in small concentrations, build into a larger problem. And the chemicals are stored in the fatty tissue parts of the mammals. So that has happened in humans as well, having a, a chemical um, accumulation, which can cause a lot of health issues. Um, so we've been talking about the bioaccumulation or the pesticide concentration, how that's happened in aquatic environments, um, and examples of how this happened in bird populations is that another chemical, it's called DDT, I'm not even going to try and um, pronounce the, the chemical name, it's quite long and clunky, um, but it's DDT was an insecticide used in the 1940s. Um, and again, it's this broad spectrum. So sprayed on a large area multiple, multiple times, trying to kill all of the, the pests around. Um, it was originally developed as uh, to combat malaria um, and other diseases in humans. Um, but then it was shifted into livestock and, and weed control, pest control as well. Um, so where the issue was with the accumulation of this DDT is that, you know, it accumulated in the soil and then in the worms. And then the birds that were eating these worms um, were accumulating really high percentages of this chemical and bird populations started to die off because the DDT actually affected um, the um, metabolizing of calcium. So the eggshells, the, the membranes around the egg were getting so thin that the birds that were nesting and laying eggs and nesting were actually crushing their young in the eggs because of the shells that were affected by this chemical. So, We've been learning a lot over the past century about, you know, long-term effects of something that we think is maybe not so bad or is a good thing to use. Um, so it just comes back to the fact that we've been learning about um, integrated pest management, trying to integrate multiple tools, not just going straight to chemical use. Um, do we have any questions at this point? Yeah. Um, so folks should have that option to either raise your hand um, and I can unmute you. Um, your question will be in the recording if you choose to uh, ask that way. Um, or alternately, please put it in the chat or there's a Q&A section where I can read questions um, out loud to Jen. Yeah, perfect. And we're gonna we're gonna get out of these kind of like larger picture things. And um, the reason why we're talking about these examples of chemicals is to show you know what's happened and had negative effects in the past, um, and just to get a bigger picture of why integrated pest management is so important to have many tools to address problems. Um, and so this slide here, uh, we're talking about predator prey populations. So we're going to move a little bit into ecology, which, you know, I only did introductory classes, so I'm going to keep this, this simple. Um, 
But you think about predator prey populations and the example in this slide is you have the hare or the rabbit and a lynx. And so the predator, the lynx, um, keeps the prey population in check. Um, and it's always a trailing system with these predator prey things. So you see in this, this little graph here that the kind of light blue color, there's, there's peaks and valleys. There's this kind of S curve you see. Um, and so the hare population spikes and then following that, the lynx population spikes to deal with the prey population spike. Um, so if we didn't have a lynx, then the hare population would get out of control and get beyond what's called the carrying capacity of the environment and the vegetation. So basically the carrying capacity of an environment is the maximum population size, um, whether it's in mammals, pests, people, the maximum population size that can be sustained by that specific environment. Um, so when you're looking into IPM strategies, if you're trying to look up information about pests, um, they're really thinking about what is the, the carrying capacity of the space that you're growing in and not going beyond that and thinking about dealing with pests. Um, so yeah, that's just another, another piece of thinking about pest populations, disease, all that sort of thing. Um, so this slide here um, is an example, again, within the insect population of this S-curve predator and prey. So in this one, we have um, ladybug, um, which can also be called a ladybird beetle. So I'll skip ahead to this slide. We'll go back to the other one. Um, but you can see, so there's the egg part of the life cycle and then the larvae. So that's the, the ladybird beetle. So you'll probably see some on your plants. Um, if you have a lot of aphids, the, the larvae or the adult, adult form will be dealing with those pests. And then you have the pupae and the adult. Um, so just different parts of the life cycle there. And so you can see there's this green dotted line that marks the carrying capacity of the environment um, where the ladybird beetle or the ladybug are. And so this pink line is the um, population explosion of aphids. And you can see there's only about five ladybird beetles beginning and then the population explodes. And then the population crashes due to overgrazing of the prey. Um, but you can see that the prey population through this blue line you know, it gets back into the rhythm of being within that carrying capacity. So it's not overwhelming the plants, not overwhelming the environment. And so these, these cycles are constant throughout the year, throughout the growing season. Um, and so this is just an example of what you might see in your gardens. And um, I'll just bring up one more point while we're here. Um, you can see that the prey population explodes first, then the predator. So the issue with using just a blanket um, chemical for dealing with the pests is that it'll knock out the prey or um, the predator population, sorry. And predator populations, as you've seen by this curve and the last, the last table here, is that the predator populations take longer to recover. So if you're using a blanket spray that's killing everything, the pests will recover quicker and the, the predators won't have time to catch up. And so you're just kind of almost encouraging lots and lots of pests. And then, so this, this, um, Increasing of, of pest populations through um, just using chemical applications on pests um, can it increase rates of resistance within pest populations, weed populations, 
um, you've probably heard of of folks becoming antibiotic resistant or the bacteria to antibiotics. Um, and so, you know, using antibiotics to treat a certain ailment is sometimes not working in folks because there's become a resistance in that pest to the treatment. Um, so that is the same in plants. Um, so why is the resistance increasing? So if you look, you look at this slide, um, there's, you know, there's first year, second year, third year, and then the nth year. So if you have a field of, of crops or weeds and you're using the chemical products on these plants, only the plants that survive this chemical application will survive. And so the next generation, if you look in the second year, the red represents these resistant plants. And so again, if you're using broad spectrum treatment, you're going to kill out all the plants that don't have resistance to this chemical. So the next generation, you have more of this resistant population until you get to the last block where almost all the plants are resistant to chemicals. So you can keep spraying them, but they're not going to be as effective the more you use a product. Um, so it just, it goes to show how smart <laughs> nature is, how smart plants and the environment is. Um, it knows how to keep things in balance. And if we're interacting in ways that are not keeping with the balance, we'll deal with the consequences. So when, when you were talking about integrated pest management, it's, it's a strategy and, and it's a toolkit that includes um, many different ways of interacting with pests and with weeds. So we'll be going over these five main um, tools that can be used to deal with pests and weeds. So there's biological, there's cultural, physical, behavioral, and chemical. Um, a chemical is usually used as a last resort if any of these other strategies or tools are not working, at least within the integrated pest management strategy world. So biological tools um, are actually using predatory insects um, to deal with the pest population. Um, so there's multiple types. We'll go over them in the next um, few sides. So really neat way to deal with pest populations. Um, I'll share an example later on of, of um, one of the ways we've been doing that at the farm that I work at in um, Wasakum territory. Um, so we talked about ladybugs or ladybird beetles. Um, so they can be used, um, you can apply, you can actually purchase large amounts of ladybugs, or if you notice in your garden or growing space, there's aphids that come and start eating your plants. Ladybugs or ladybird beetles will just show up. It's really fascinating. Um, but you can actually apply ladybugs to an area that is overcome with aphids, and they will just have a grand old time. They'll eat and eat and eat and hopefully get the aphid population under control. Um, so they'll often overwinter in, you know, plants, that sort of thing under rocks and come out when the prey population is, is, is high. Um, so you can actually use microbiology to control um, pests and diseases as well. One that's often used in um, kind of larger scale organic farming systems is this BT um, or Bacillus thuringiensis. <laughs> so it's actually a soil borne um, bacteria that's um, when it's digested by caterpillars of moths and butterflies, it actually destroys their digestive system. And so, excuse me, um, they'll die. Um, and so it's often used um, for crops like potatoes, corn, cabbages, who have a lot of moth type predators that will lay caterpillars 
that will eat um, the plants. Um, another microbial biocontrol, it's called trichoderma, and it's used to treat um, fungal diseases that often affect um, plants, again, like tomatoes, potatoes, corn. Um, so I don't know if anyone has dealt with um, powdery mildew, but it's a really nasty fungus that can spread quite quickly um, once the season turns from hot to more humid, wet, and cold. That's when the, um, the powdery mildew fungus thrives. And so this trichoderma, again, is an organic control to get um, uh, to deal with powdery mildew. And what this fungus does, it actually colonizes the roots of the plants you're trying to protect. So it'll just cover the root hairs of the plants underground and actually creates a physical barrier for the bad um, fungal diseases to inhibit the plant. So it's pretty, pretty cool thing. It's like a little bit of warfare happening underground that you can't even see unless you can look under a microscope. Um, parasitoids. Um, these are insects that have an immature life stage. So we looked at that ladybug cycle. So everything until you get to the adult is the immature life stage. Um, and then it actually uses a host. So it will actually live in or on another insect. Um, and they're very prone to death by insecticide. And so you can see in this photo, this was actually an aphid that was infected by most likely a wasp who laid its eggs inside, the eggs hatched and actually ate the insect. So it's kind of like it's alien-esque. It's, um, it's kind of creepy, but it's a very effective biological um, tool with certain uh, insects. Um, so this wasp here is an example of one of these um, parasitoid insects. So they lay their eggs inside cabbage worms. So you can see this cabbage worm is just littered with these eggs and it will eventually kill the worms. Um, so that's that was that first tool in the five that we were looking at in the IPM toolkit. Um, so there's al also cultural tools that are non-chemical, and it's often the first line of defense in organic growing systems. And it's really about the, the management practices done by the grower. So it's based on experience, knowledge, um, but there's a lot of different strategies um, within this cultural tools that we'll go through in the next few slides. Um, and I've, I've used a lot of these as well. They're quite effective in growing systems. And you've probably used some of these as well. Um, so cover crops, they're not necessarily your cash crop or the food crop that you're going to eat, but there's specific crops planted in an area um, that often perform many, many functions. So they suppress weeds by having a good ground cover. Um, they prevent soil erosion by having, again, covering the ground and the roots of these cover crops hold the soil intact. Um, they'll stop nutrient leaching and um, they act as a habitat for these predator um, insects to deal with pest populations. So they're often used on larger scale farming operations, but I work with farmers who are growing even on a quarter acre and they'll utilize cover crops for all of these functions. Um, they're especially good to plant over the winter so that your soil's not washing away in the rain. Um, No-till is a way to um, to deal with pests and disease. So um, there's a lot of talk th these days about low or no-till agriculture. So in this case, it's a growing system where you don't um, cultivate or dig till the soil at all. 
Um, and so soil will often hold a lot. It's called a, a seed bank. You can see on this um, this slide, but it's it's um, weed seeds that will live in the soil and then grow or emerge when the conditions are right. So if you're constantly disturbing the soil, it's bringing up these weed seeds. So if you're not cultivating the soil, um, it's harder for these weeds to grow. Um, so you can see in this photo um, that there's a lot of straw mulch used um, to cover the soil to suppress weeds. Um, so yeah, no-till is another way um, to, uh, another cultural tool you can use in preventing um, pest problems or weed problems. Um, there's something called companion planting, which I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, um, but it can also be called uh, trap cropping. So you plant a crop next to the crop you actually want to keep healthy to protect it. Um, so you can see in this photo, these yellow rings around the green plants in the middle are often a trap crop that folks will use. They'll plant this. And then when the trap crop becomes overwhelmed with the pests, you can actually remove that crop and it removes the pest population. So some folks will, will do that. Some folks will leave the, the trap crops as well, but if the pest population gets really, really high, it's often best to remove. Um, yeah, so that's all I'll say about that one. Growing a variety of different plants in an area can help prevent um, pest problems. And there's been a lot of um, seed growers in the last decades, and I, I know this has been done for millennia, um, but breeding seeds to have certain qualities. Um, and in this case, um, breeding seeds of a certain plant to be resistant to pest or disease damage. Um, so one of the seed companies that's actually from the States that a lot of farmers use is called Johnny's Seeds. And they have lots, lots of um, disease resistant plant seeds that you can get. And they, they fare much better against say, powdery mildew or aphid infestation, depending on what your, your issues are. Um, pruning is often a great cultural tool or strategy as well. Um, you can see in this photo, this is a fruit tree, but pruning in any sort of a growing system, um, what you're aiming to do is create a lot of air um, airflow and ability for moisture to cycle around. You wanna reduce humidity, um, whether that's in a tree canopy or say you're growing a tomato plant. Folks will often prune off some of the suckers or plants to create more airflow to prevent any issues. Weed management is also a cultural tool. Um, so it's good to keep in mind when you're thinking of um, thresholds and actions you may need to do to deal with pest or weed populations. Um, like, like we were talking about in the last slide, pruning um, will create airflow and less uh, humidity and moisture. Weeding can do that as well. If your plants are surrounded with a lot of other plant matter, it's often hard for air to flow. And then things like fungal diseases can really just take off really quickly. Um, Bianca, do we have any questions at this point or should I, should I keep going here? There's no questions in the chat. Um, we can pause for a moment in case anyone sure. has questions so far. Yeah. And again, um, I did see some new participants. So um, oh, you're welcome to raise your hand um, or type the question in the chat or in the Q&A at any point. And um, we'll, we'll continue to, to take breaks in case folks um, have questions. Yeah, and I'm, this is a, it's a lot of information. Um, so I'm happy to, um, Bianca and Gary have um, the PowerPoint presentation, but I'm happy to put it into a PDF and then we can send it out to participants just to kind of refer back to it. And I can also leave my 
speaker notes in there that has a bit more in-depth um, information that's helping remind me what we're talking about today. Um, okay, great. So you can see there's a lot of cultural tools in the IPM toolkit. Um, and again, these are, these are um, management strategies. So when you're thinking about your growing space, no matter how large or small it is, um, you can think of ways to include these different cultural actions. Um, I'm sure some you're, you're already including in the way that you're growing. Um, but maybe you're learning a few new ones here today that you can maybe try for next year. Um, so biodiversity. So a lot of different varieties of plants in an area can help um, spread the potential disease load around or pest load. So if you have like acres of corn and you get a pest, can often decimate the whole crop. But if you have, say, like five or six crops in an area, you may lose some of the crop, but each crop is affected by different pests, so you won't lose your whole harvest. So growing lots of different plants for different functions is, is a way to, um, to utilize IPM. Yeah, so we've talked about um, biological tools. We've talked about cultural tools. Um, and then there's different physical tools and actions you can use to address um, pests and weeds and diseases. So physical tools are actually a physical barrier that helps um, prevent the spread of pests or disease. Um, so some you may be using already, it's called, um, excuse me, row cover, or you can use insect netting. So this is really good for pests like the flea beetle which tend to like um, plants in the brassica family, like mustards, broccoli, um, that sort of thing. Cabbages, they're all in the same plant family. Um, flea beetles are often very, very tiny. They're this tiny black little flea fly thing. Um, and so if you can exclude them from the crop, you have a much better chance that there's not gonna be any damage. Um, and you can see it's pretty easy to utilize. They're just using bricks to hold down this insect net in this um, photo. So yeah, covering is a great option. Um, exclusion fences. So if you have pests that are larger, like deer, bears, rabbits, coyotes, etc., fencing is often a good physical barrier. Um, things like hedgerows. So hedgerows are plants that are grown for a function um, that's usually outside of food production. Um, so you can see in this picture here, there's some trees that were planted. It looks like potentially a fruit tree actually, but they're planted here in a line to create a windbreak. So the larger that these hedgerows, these trees get, the more wind that they will protect from, you know, affecting a, a crop. Um, and hedgerows are often perennial plants or plants that live year after year after year. You don't harvest them in one year like an annual. And so perennials are um, often habitat for beneficial um, predators, beneficial insects that will deal with your pest populations. Um, so hedgerows are um, another really important strategy. They're kind of a longer term strategy because they'll usually take a few years to get themselves established. But again, it's a physical break. Ditches, so if you have a really wet area, creating ditches is often a really good way to um, remove standing water, which will prevent you know, mosquito outbreaks, um, improve drainage of the site, and also provide habitat um, for insects, fishes, that sort of thing, birds. Okay, so there's behavioral tools as well. And I know there's a, I feel like I, I've, in my own understanding, only scratched the surface in IPM. So it's good to have, you know, notes that you keep 
keep for yourself year after year. Um, utilizing IPM is a constant learning process. Um, and so I hope you guys are going to be gentle and patient with yourselves as you're learning these strategies. It takes time, it takes patience, and it takes observation. So don't be too hard on yourselves <laughs> as we're learning all these different tools. Um, so behavioral tools are something that I've been learning more about this year. Um, so they often use uh, pheromones to trap a crop or um, to trap a pest. Um, and so pheromones are how males find the females to reproduce. Um, and so if you can um, distract or confuse the males, you can prevent um, reproduction, which will prevent the pest from having a larger population the next year. So in this image here, this is called um, the Vernon pitfall trap. Um, so it's something that was actually developed on the lower mainland. And this is used to um, collect click beetles. So click beetles are um, their larval state or yeah, so their, their immature state are called wireworm. And wireworm are major, major agricultural pest, growing pest. Um, and they're, they're in areas that used to be in pasture or grass. That's our ideal habitat. So if you're changing you know, your yard into um, a growing space, you'll probably have to deal with wireworms for the first few years after turning that land over. Um, they're one of my least, <laughs> I really don't like wireworm. They, they, they give you a lot of issues. But the neat thing with this trap is, so you see in um, B here, there's this white little vial that's on the inside of the lid of the trap. So in that vial are the pheromones that release over time. And you put the section A, you dig it into the ground. So it's literally a pitfall. The click beetles fall into this trap because they're attracted by the pheromone. And then you're able to remove these click beetles from your growing space um, so that these click beetles are not able to fully mature and then lay eggs, which become the wireworm. So um, we're using these at a farm that I work at. And one of our growers, um, there one day there was 600 click beetles that were found in one of the traps. So I'm hopeful that next year or in the next bunch of years, the wireworm population will be decreasing. So this is, this is an example of a behavioral tool. Um, and they're often used in orchards as well. Um, so basically you can see in these photos that you'll cloud an area with, with um, pheromones to disrupt the reproduction because the males will come, but they'll be distracted by the, the pheromones that you're um, distributing and not be able to find the females. Um, and then last but not least, um, there are chemical tools that are utilized to deal with um, pests, diseases. These are often the last line of defense because as we learned earlier on, there's been a lot of um, a lot of damage done by the overuse of chemicals. So um, you're not a bad grower if you need to use chemicals, but I, I highly encourage you to utilize a lot of the other IPM tools or strategies before um, using chemicals because it's safe for, for yourself as well and it's safer for the environment. All right, I'll pause again here, just kind of let things settle. And again, um, any question, no question is a silly question. Um, so I'll just pause for a minute and we can let all this sink in.
All right. I know that wasn't a full minute, so I guess I'm excited and impatient. <laughs> um, so we, we've talked about a lot of things so far. Why do we need IPM? What is it? What are some of the tools in the toolkit and management strategies? So some of the key themes that we've been talking about is um, knowledge. So in order to deal with a pest that you're dealing with, you need to be able to understand it. Um, and there's a lot of information out there um, where you can, you know, look up images of a pest to figure out what it is and then learn about its life cycle to know how to deal with it. So building your knowledge base is a continual way of utilizing IPM. Monitoring is really, really key because if you're not observing what's around, you don't know what's around and you're not able to pick up on the cues of when to act. Um, thresholds, that word has come up quite a bit and we'll talk about it a bit more, but basically how many pests is too many um, before you need to, before you need to act or take an action. Um, record keeping, really, really important. Um, memory is fallible. I think I'll remember everything. I usually remember a quarter of what I take in. So writing things down, having a notebook or a Google Doc, something that you can access easily. And you know, if you're doing a monitoring walk and you're like, oh, okay, it's June and I see flea beetles. It's early June, the temperature is about you know, 15 degrees. I should keep an eye on that for next year to know when the flea beetle is coming. So having records, really, really, really helpful. And then evaluating at the end of a season, how did the strategies that you implemented work? What didn't work? Um, and what can you potentially change for your next growing season? How better success? So yeah, knowledge, monitoring, thresholds, records, evaluating. So it's this constant cycle. It's never finished because life isn't static. So it's neat. You can always improve. You can always learn more. Um, so knowledge, there's a ton of good fact sheets online. So um, what is really helpful is when you're Googling a pest, um, once you've figured out what it is, Google the pest name and then add extension because there's, you know, there's a lot of these home gardening sites that will have useful information sometimes, but um, there's universities that focus on pests and will have a wealth of information on the life cycle, how to deal with them. Um, so if you add an extension, you'll be able to build your knowledge base much larger. Um, and you can see this last point, learning life cycles, weaknesses, strengths, when and where pests are, and the hosts of certain pests. So building knowledge day by day, really, really helpful. Um, so monitoring is, again, taking that time to, to look at your plants and see, are they healthy? If they're not, What's going on? Um, if you're not monitoring, you won't know what pests are around. Um, so, you know, a lot of farmers will often take, you know, an hour or so garden walk or farm walk and get really close and personal with the plants. Look to see how the leaves are. Look on the underside of leaves because often pests or diseases will kind of hide on the underside. And just observe, you know, like, are my plants healthy and green? If they're not, hmm, maybe this is yellow. Maybe I can look up what does yellow mean? What does a stressed plant look like? Um, what are common pests of this plant so that I can identify what might be an issue? Um, so monitoring, really, really important. And it's good to remind you to slow down, um, just take in the beauty of the environment of the world um, of these plants that are alive and just to really be present. Um, I find that monitoring walks really kind of ground me. 
quite enjoy them. Um, there's different ways of monitoring. Like I said, you can do that physical interaction with the plant, depending on how big your plant is. Um, often with like fruit trees, you can see there's this beading sheet. So you literally have some material underneath that's kind of stiff. And then you can gently beat or shake the plant. And then the insects that are on the plant will land on the sheet. So you'll be able to observe how much of what pest is there, um, that sort of thing. For insects like moths and flies, that um, lighting traps can be helpful as well. So you can see there's a light in the middle here and there's a, a funnel underneath. So the insect will you know, come towards the light and then fall in the funnel. So you'll be able to see what's around. Um, do I need to be taking any action or not? So these are a couple other techniques and tools that you can use for monitoring. And then thresholds. So this is really, when do you act? Um, it's, it's pretty common to expect some disease, weeds, or um, pest pressure for a plant, um, especially in organic systems where you're not utilizing um, uh, synthetic chemicals. Um, but you get to decide when is the action threshold when, you know, if I have a tomato plant and um, I'm starting to notice powdery mildew, when I notice it on one leaf, that's when I'm going to act. Am I going to prune that leaf off and keep a close eye? Um, or is it when half the plant is covered? You get to learn about your pest, your disease, and decide what you're comfortable with for an action. Um, so again, this comes with learning, understanding um, whatever pest, weed, disease you're dealing with, and then deciding when you want to act. And so monitoring is a big part of knowing when your action threshold will be, um, how you can do some prevention and controlling of um, these issues. So here's an example of um, some thresholds. So you can see at the top here, plant emergence or transplanting. So that's, you know, when plants are germinating, you can keep an eye at that stage or after you transplant a crop like a tomato or a cucumber from outside uh, or inside to outside. Um, so you can see on this table, the person who made it decided that for flea beetles, again, those little black fleas, um, the, the telltale sign that you have flea beetles is that it'll look like tiny little bullet holes through the leaves of your plant. That's a sign that you've got flea beetles. So this person decided for them that, um, you know, about 50% of newly emerged plants are infested with this shot hole injury is present. That's when they're going to take an action. Other people, it might be, okay, I've been growing for like five years. I know that flea beetles come out about this time. I'm going to use some insect net before I even see the flea beetles to prevent. Um, so again, it's up to you what your action threshold will be. Um, yeah, so the this page, you know, they're talking about um, cabbage aphids and other aphids. It, they said to treat when like 2% of the plants are infested with five aphids or less. So again, some people might think, ah, I'll let it get a bit worse before I start treating. Depends on what your, um, your comfort level is and your experience level with this particular um, pest or disease or weed. Okay, and then I just wanna finish off with really emphasizing records and note-taking. Um, like I said before, you could use a Google Sheet, you can access through your phone, paper, notebook. Um, I have a notebook I always keep with me at the farm. Um, 
And you can see the different types of information you can be tracking. So um, record the past scouting. So when you see it the first time or the second time in the season, the date, the weather, any actions that you took or will be taking um, and how they worked. Um, so yeah, that is the, uh, the end of this presentation. Uh, I'm happy to go back to any other slides. Um, and again, any, any questions you might have, um, any pests, diseases, weeds that you, you keep seeing over and over and over, um, you can ask about that. Um, just wanted to thank you for your attention. I know this is a bit um, technically heavy, um, but it's important to get an understanding of what IPM is, why it's important before you can put it into practice. Um, yeah, I'll leave some space now. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, yeah, I was listening and, and taking notes and I'm, I'm sure many other people were doing the same. Um, I know that we have a mix of um, folks who have individual gardens. So, you know, some communities um, are supporting backyard gardens. Um, some have, you know, small scale agriculture. So um, I'm sure we're running into different issues at different sizes and scales. And, um, you know, I can't help but think about my own garden space that I had um, last season. And um, I just want to put it out there, we were talking about aphids and um, I had an aphid problem. Um, mm. And so I uh, just wanna springboard some questions around that. So for like a beginner gardener, like myself last year, I had I had no idea, I knew like ladybugs were a part of it, but I had no idea like, where do I get ladybugs? So like, um, I guess I have a general question about like directing people to, to like local resources and where folks can um, either find information or like supportive resources, like some of the examples you've provided, like some of the tools. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, and often um, like gardening stores in your area are a good resource to ask about sourcing. Um, you know, if you're gonna use microbial or biological tools or applications like you want to buy some uh, ladybugs or you want to use some predatory nematodes for wireworms, um, going to your local gardening center is often a good starting point. Um, in BC, uh, there's actually a, a large company, they're called Applied Bionomics, and they're actually in um, North Saanich, but their whole business is reading populations of predator pests, depending on what you're looking for. Um, and depending on the pests, sometimes they'll recommend, you know, purchasing ladybugs for aphids. Um, they often work better, or they're more effective if they're in a more controlled environment. So say you have aphids in a greenhouse, Releasing a bunch of ladybugs um, will be more effective there. You can release it in the open, but you know the ladybugs will fly off and do their own thing. So they'll let you know kind of what the best course of action is. They ship all over the world um, and they're really extremely knowledgeable. Um, they have on staff people they call their, their pest doctors really, really helpful at recommendations and explaining what's going on. Um, but yeah, often garden stores. So on, on uh, Vancouver Island in, you know, Saanich area, um, there's a gardening store called Buckerfields and they actually sell some of these biological um, predators um, in small quantities or larger quantities. Yeah, I hope that's I hope that's helpful. Um, and again, if you're Googling a pest, if you put extension behind it, you'll get really um, clear information on pests, diseases, weeds, and good courses of action to take.
Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Jen. Um, we have a question from Shayla. Um, so the question is, any suggestions of cultural controls for root aphids in pots? Yeah, so I saw that and I've actually never dealt with um, root aphids before. I did a, a quick little search um, and it looks like, uh, I don't know if you, you guys have heard of neem oil, but it's, it, it's an organic substance um, that is often effective in, um, you know, house plants on dealing with different pest issues um, or potted plants. So neem oil, you usually spray on the plant, the foliage leaves, that sort of thing. You can also spray it on the soil. Um, so that is a potential um, management strategy. Um, it's saying that root aphids are difficult to eliminate, which is unfortunate because they live in the soil. So they have that place to hide. Um, so what I would do is, yeah, I would look up root aphid extension, learn a bit more about the life cycle and see if there's any um, removal techniques, depending on how large these aphids are. Um, that would be my recommendation. Crows or magpies, merging onions and bees. Ugh, yes, birds. <laughs> they can often be a huge issue. Um, physical barriers are often um, uh, quite effective with birds. So um, things like nets, um, uh, you can even use almost like cages, like create a, a, a little roof or structure. Um, emerging onions and beans. So I don't know if this is useful for crows or magpies, but I know some birds are deterred by um, lights or like bright flashy things. So I, I know some folks in gardens will hang, you know, like CDs or something sparkly on string around the crop that they're trying to keep something away from. Um, I think crows are attracted to shiny things, so that might not work for them. Um, depending on how annoying the birds are as well, um, I know that some growers use sounds um, to deter birds. Um, so like large farms, I know will use like noise cannons, which aren't, you know, necessarily, that's probably not practical in your application. Um, but yeah, with birds, often a physical barrier is kind of your best shot. Yeah. I saw um, Dan Dan with his hand up earlier. Did you still have a question? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> I've, I have a book that has um, natural plants, trees, bushes, berries. Throughout the book, it, it informed me of introduced plants. Mm. I was wondering if all the bugs and aphids are attracted to these in, introduced plants and is there an interaction of them and the introduced plants say dandelion and uh, blackberries um presently they've been now coming into our territory and mm -hmm. i'm concerned about that neat thank you yeah, no, thank you. That's a really, um, yeah, I think that's a really good point you're making. Um, a lot of these introduced species, um, they definitely have certain pest populations that go after them. Um, and I think when we have environments and areas where there's not a lot of diversity, when that diversity has been wiped out, um, that's when these issues can often arise. And so, yeah, I think I think what you brought up is really, um, it's really true. And the more that we can reintroduce 
um, diversity, biodiversity, variety of different plants that are, you know, perennials that are annuals um, that attract certain insects and, um, and other um, wildlife into the area, I think helps to bring back some of that balance. Um, again, having some pest pressure is, is normal and it's part of that life cycle of having a diverse environment, having that predator prey S curve. Um, it's so, I think, I think diversity and trying to get rid of some of these invasives can hopefully reduce pest populations. Yeah, I think stand them. Um, and he put a note in the chat as well saying, um, you've seen people put out like fake owls, plastic owls on fences and near crops to keep birds away. I've also seen that. So thank you for, um, for bringing that up. That can be a good uh, trick. It's like putting out a scarecrow. We'll let folks have a few more moments here for questions. Um, and I just wanted to also make a comment. I saw uh, that hedgerows um, were a strategy and um, just wanted to share that one of my passions is um, native plant species in BC. And, um, you know, you can double your money or double your luck by um, planting native hedgerows. Um, and, uh, you know, that has a lot of different uh, benefits as well um, by choosing native plants in your region. So um, some of the highlights are that it reduces the need to water. So you may only need to water them for one to two years, um, especially if you plant in the fall. Um, and uh, the other benefit is that you introduce native pollinator species. Um, which, you know, will help with your growing season. So um, there's uh, a little bit of information there um, or just a comment, um, but I did have a question on the note of pollinators. So you brought up microbial controls um, and that they affected um, insects. Um, I can't remember the specific name of it, um, but I'm wondering if you introduce a microbial control, does that affect all of the insects in that area or like, is it specific to certain insect species? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in my experience with dealing with microbial controls, they are pest specific. So they will only affect that pest um, and not, and they won't be dangerous to the rest of um, pests pest or insect populations or bird populations in the area. Um, yeah, so they, they are safe to use. Um, and thank you for bringing that up about um, uh, native plants. There's, uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of different resources where you can learn more about like what grows well in your area. And again, about time of planting, um, maintenance all that sort of stuff. And it's just incredible um, to encourage environment for these, um, you know, these predator insects, but also pollinators, like you brought up. They're such a key, um, they're so important in growing anything, um, our pollinators and creating more habitat as they're facing a lot of challenges is great to include in your systems. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just want to note we're winding down here. Um, we can stay online um, and close the recording if folks um, have additional questions for a few more minutes. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that we have a short survey. Um, if you can, please fill it out. Um, the intention of the survey um, is to better understand how we're doing. So it's, you know, the first time that we're launching a series like this um, with the program being held at iSpark. So we really value your feedback. Um, it's also a chance for you to let us know what you'd like to see in the future, um, what, you know, we can do differently um, and, you know, how we can improve the series going forward. Um, 
I also wanted to let folks know um, that there are um, additional webinars being held in the future. So, um, that information will be shared on our website, um, through our email list, um, through our newsletter, on Instagram, um, and on Facebook. So um, if you'd like to um, be included on a direct mail out list, please let me know. I can take your email and make sure that you get the information. Um, the next uh, webinars after that um, in September um, will be with Calista Pruden, um, and she will talk about seed saving. Uh, and then in October, we have uh, folks from uh, the Clam Garden Network sharing about um, clam gardens. So um, if you're on the coast um, and you're looking at revitalizing um, beaches or perhaps identifying clam gardens within your territories, um, that would be a really great session as well. So mm -hmm. uh, just letting, letting everybody know um, that those are coming up uh, in the next few months here. Um, and um, I am going to spin the magic wheel 